Dogs are not robots. Dogs are their own individual little selves. Definitely have felt burnt out at some events. It is a long running show that is a train that has basically been derailed. Anyone that knows me knows that I love dogs more than people most of the time. And that's why I can't wait for you to meet today's guest. She was born in North Bay, Canada. You've seen her on The Late Show with David Letterman, Nickelodeon, The CW, multiple NBA and NFL halftime shows. She came fifth on America's Got Talent and has the number one dog training app on iOS and Android. It's Sarah Carson. I've obviously known you for a little bit. I follow your stuff online. I love watching all your travels, all your dogs, cats, any other animals that seem to appear. You are the animal whisperer. I wish you lived in my house, to be honest, because I have three dogs who don't listen to me, but they're wonderful. I love them to bits. They're all rescues. Rescued me more than me rescuing them. But how did you get started? In the beginning, I didn't have a whole lot of friends. I wasn't super social. I felt really out of place and kind of an outcast. And my family got a little Cocker Spaniel puppy. And he basically just took over my entire life and became my entire personality. So I basically started doing that. I had my Spaniel. We started trick training and agility. And I got into all the various dog sports. And I initially just did it because it was a fun thing to do. And I, I felt like every time I came home, the dog was excited to see me and I enjoyed spending time with him, you know, just basically companionship, but I, I wanted to do more. And so I started to train other people's dogs and I got into, like you said, sometimes there's random animals on my feed. I've trained chipmunks, I've trained cats, all of the things. So I, I kind of just got super invested and involved in dog training that way. I went through some school for training and I kind of got to understand a little bit just basic dog training skills, you know, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, all those things. And then I got Hero. So I, I got a Border Collie who honestly changed my life. And with him, and I know you've been on ADT and ADT the Champions, but what kind of happened, or maybe it was Hero, that took you from training dogs to competing to performing on stage? Because there's such different situations to be in. Like, I get nervous enough going on stage. I can't imagine having a dog go on stage with you. And, you know, I know they're super well trained. But is there a part of you that sometimes is like, well, something could happen? Or has anything ever happened, like, unexpected? So Hero was a unicorn. I was never nervous about how he was going to do at all in any environment. He was just perfect. But now that I have six dogs that are not hero, it is, it is very stressful. <laughs> like I just had a gig that I had done in the past and this, this one didn't work out. So they just booked me for the fall and I'm sitting here like the dog that I used previously is retired now. And I don't know what these new dogs are going to do in that kind of environment. So it is a very, very stressful situation, but basically the jump from competing and just training people's dogs was David Letterman. I went on Stupid Pet Tricks. It was just before he retired. I want to say a couple of years before Letterman retired. And then I got a call asking if I wanted to move to the United States because I'm Canadian and start performing for a living. And that was kind of my introduction to it. And I came to the U.S. with no clue what I was going to do, no clue where I was going to live not a clue as to what routine I was going to do. Like I just had a really good dog and a really good relationship with him and I knew we could do it. So that's kind of at the very beginning. That's how that kind of panned out. I know how that feels a little bit as someone who is not from the US but lives here now and just packing two suitcases and going, let's see what happens when I get there. And worst, <laughs> you know what, worst case scenario, you can always go home. If it doesn't work out, you can always go back. But when you're offered these opportunities, you have to just take them and run with them because you never know where you're going to end up and what's going to happen. You've lived a whole, a whole life. You've had so much go on. And I love watching your two little cats that you've been training. Oh my it, gosh. I am obsessed. You're making me want a cat again. I'm like, I need a little one. I need a little, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. So how was your experience with AGT. As a fellow Got Talent person, but Britain Got Talent, I know it can be stressful. I know it's a lot and you have, a, I think, a lot more rounds on the America's Got Talent. But how did that come about and the ups and downs through that whole experience? I mean, I'm super grateful. I'll start out by saying that. Super grateful for the experience and the opportunities that they gave me. And especially like one of the dogs that I was on the show with has passed. So just being able to have those memories with him is just awesome. And so that experience alone was worth every anxiety attack and mental breakdown that I went through. But the show really, 
it is it is a long running show that is a train that has basically been derailed that is just going through the tracks. So it is a lot to deal with, especially with someone that has dogs on the show. I personally never really felt like the dogs were super welcome. I think that they go towards like magicians or singers or group acts that are really easy to communicate with and organize. But like a dog, like you said, that dog could go on stage and be scared of something and not want to perform. And that did happen to me in the semifinals. I had to switch dogs last minute and thankfully it worked out, but they're animals and you really can't control that. So the entire experience was a lot. And I do feel like I, I learned a lot from it, especially with myself and my dogs, but it, it was worth, it was worth every, every moment. How did your life change after AGT? Do you feel like career wise, it was a real boost that it opened doors for you? How was it afterwards? I mean, any form of attention like that is going to open up some doors. I got some really cool opportunities, um, but it did for me at least didn't really do a whole lot because COVID happened. And then I feel like COVID was just a really big reset button. So I did it, got a whole bunch of opportunities, went back and did champions and then COVID happened. And so I didn't see any form of anything because of that. Anybody that was hiring was obviously no longer hiring. So nobody was really looking for live entertainment at all. Yeah. What did you do during that time? Were you just say, I'm going to be home and I'm going to keep training? Because it's not like you can just take a break. Like with a no. lot of us, we took a few months off. But I don't think you can really do that with dogs. Do you feel like you have to train them at every day to keep everything so they remember everything like how does the that dogs work? are like a, they're a 24 hour job even if i'm not training them i still have to care for them so thankfully like i my dogs live in a kennel so they have that separate space for themselves but i mean they come in the house and they do dog things we go on hikes we do training all that stuff but yeah during COVID, i was not able to take a break from dogs but because i wasn't working i was able to write a book so basically i spent the entire year writing a book. I have it. I have your app too, but we'll get to that. But for anyone that doesn't know, tell us about your book for anyone that hasn't seen it. Yeah. So I was reached out by the publisher asking if I would be interested and I had always really wanted to write a book. So I went ahead and did it and it's called Super Dog Tricks and it covers basic obedience, puppy stuff, leash walking, crate training, and then all of the tricks that you've seen me do with my dogs. So it is a super, super cool thing that I was able to to wrap in a bow for people to take home and like you said, put on yourself and hopefully teach your dogs some new tricks. So that's for anyone. If you have a new puppy, you have an older dog, that's for anyone. It's not just someone that wants to get into what you're doing on like such yeah. a big scale it's more, you know, for everyone. Yeah. It's just a great way to bond with your dog. So just taking like five to 10 minutes a day, using your dog's meals just to teach them sit or shake a paw or roll over. Like that kind of stuff will help build that relationship. hundred percent. I think most of your dogs have been border collies, right? Am I right in saying that? Mm -hmm. So are there certain breeds that are somewhat easier to train or do you usually work with set ones? I know obviously size as well, like mine are tiny, they're like four pounds. So that <laughs> they have a bit of a restriction on what they can do. I take her agility training though, but she has like a little tiny ramp, not this huge oh, thing. Oh my gosh. Um, you try, Spencer. But yeah, why Border Collies? Tell us um, about It really just comes down to, it, it's, it's a job. So I wouldn't get a Pomeranian and if the dog didn't want to do the job, keep it and force it to do the job. So getting a Border Collie, it was like, this is a working dog. These dogs live to work. And I have had, I've had four Border Collies that didn't want to do it. They could learn all the tricks because they love learning. But once you put them on a stage in front of people, they're like, eh, this is for me. But I do have one Golden Retriever, but he's not your average Golden Retriever. So he's a field Golden. He's bred for hunting. And he's crazier than the Border Collies. He lacks brain, but he has the stamina and the energy and like the work ethic like a Border Collie. So it really just comes down to finding a dog that wants to do the job. It's so funny you say Pomeranian because I have one falling asleep next to me who always has to be with me, will follow me around, go to the toilet. She's like right there. I'm like, I did oh. two minutes, two minutes a piece. I'm like, I love you. But yeah, I literally found her on the street near my house, like wandering around. Oh. They find me. I don't need to go look in. They'll just turn up at my front door, bless them. But I always hear about like the, the cat distribution. Like, you know how it's like, oh, they, they've chosen me today. And then there's just a stray cat. I've never heard of dogs doing that. So that's a new one for me. It, yeah, it's ridiculous, <laughs> if I'm honest. Like, I love her to bits. They're all older now. Like, my oldest now is, she turns 17 this year. I mean, roughly. Wow. She turns 17. She's been doing pretty well. She, like, lost some of her sight this year. So that's been, like, the oh, yeah. biggest thing even more so than her heart she has a heart murmur enlarged heart 
So she's on meds every day. She sounds like she smokes a pack a day with her cough. But oh, no. in the grand scheme of things, she's doing very well. She still uses the dog door and like, I like, now I've got a stroller for her to take her outside. Cause I feel guilty cause I can't walk her cause she just falls off the curb and it's like. Yeah, so 17 is also. impressive. Yeah. Like, and then my other one, my pond is what, 12, maybe 13. No teeth, we have to remove all of her teeth. Oh, when I got gosh. her. They were all rotten in her mouth, all this stuff, so. Oh my gosh. I'm the person that has all the dogs that have got something wrong with them. The geriatric dogs. <laughs> They're living forever though. I'm like, this is great. Like, because my oldest is my first dog ever. Yeah. I got, you know, I never had dogs before. So I, d- I didn't know what I was doing when I got her. I went into a pet store to buy treats for a friend's dog and they had like adoption day. And I was like, oh, here's that little dog. Let's just look. No one ever just has a Nobody look. Nobody does. Have a dog. I had no idea. Didn't have a clue. And then I like, they got her out for me and she sat on my lap and just didn't move. And I'm crying and like, you hear the story and like all the thing, you know, the past and whatever. And I'm like, just bawling, bawling, bawling. And then, yeah, she came home. I was like, you're coming home. I have no idea Aww. what to do with you. Like, you know, but you, you learn. And she, she picked me, I think. It was meant to be, but I love dogs. <laughs> it's the only reason I want to get a bigger house is so I can just adopt more dogs. Yeah. But that's... That's my, my dream one day. I love it. Keep adopting the, the old dogs that are, you know, because it's tough when they're older. Everyone wants yeah. the puppies. Okay, so tell us about your app. Why the app? How did that come about? How do you even start that kind of thing to go, I'm going to put this out to the world? Yeah, so I, again, I knew that I wanted to do an app. I thought that it would be a really creative, unique way for people that have a busy schedule or are stuck at home to bond with their dogs and do something with their dogs. So I actually got an email from Mike and Alice. They're the uh, developers on the app and they basically had created the app. They had it all completed and they just needed a dog trainer. And so it was just the perfect opportunity for us to get together and make it happen. We released it the day my audition aired for America's Got Talent and it's grown a lot since then. But uh, it is, I mean, it's been app of the day several times on the app store for iOS. It's won awards for Google Play Store. So it's doing pretty well. And we're just really excited to build a community on there and and help some dog owners out. How did you decide what sort of things you were going to put on there? Obviously, there's certain things that everyone needs to know, even if you want to learn the basics, just to be able to go out in the world with your dog, go to the dog park, things like that. For someone that's just like trying to get by, trying to get their dog to do the bare minimum, like how do you decide all that kind of stuff? Um, So we... The app initially started out with just tricks. It was very, very basic, but it was just tricks, just the stuff that you were going to see me do on America's Got Talent. And then it did grow into crate training, leash walking. Now we have like a full on puppy program. So when you get a puppy, you can go on there and follow step by step what you should be doing each week to make sure that your puppy has success. It started out as just a simple, let's teach our dogs to sit down, stay, shake a paw and now you can go on there and learn nose work and dock diving and agility and a whole bunch of stuff. There's a lot of dog trainers out there. I see little clips here and there pop on my Instagram, but what do you think sets your training apart from others that are out there? So I always tell people, and I've said this even like before my book and before my app, the proof is in the dog. If you're trying to get your dog trained by someone who can't demonstrate with their own dog what they're trying to teach you, kind of a red flag. So I think that what sets me apart is that I've had so many successful dogs. Even the dogs I've rehomed to pet homes, they've been very successful. They can do all the behaviors. They're just not cut out for my lifestyle and the traveling and the performing and the constant change of environment. But they were all very well trained and could do a boatload of things. So I just really think the the proof is in the dogs. And I know Hero is extremely special, but I've been able to basically do it again with every single dog I've owned. Have you ever taken like other people's dogs? Will people come to you and be like, please train my dog for whatever reason, whether it's within like performing or magic or just needing that bit of help for whatever reason? Do they come to you for that still now? I have, I've done board and trains here and there. I don't typically do it on a regular basis just because of my own travel schedule. But in the fall or the the winter months, particularly, I'm not very busy. So I'll do board and trains here and there. It's, it's definitely case by case basis. 
I'm not going to say I don't enjoy it, but it is a lot of work, especially when somebody is dropping their dog off from across the country and you're trying to communicate with them what you're teaching the dog and how they need to keep it up and all that stuff. So it is a lot of work and it's very stressful, but I still do it from time to time. I guess that you only have a certain amount of time too. It's not like it's just, let's see how long it takes. It's like, yeah, you've got a few weeks or a month or whatever. And it's like, yeah, we've got to get this done because you need to go home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Home. Exactly, exactly. So I mentioned earlier, I obviously have all rescue dogs. I didn't get them when they were puppies. They've all been older. I think the youngest was two when I got here. The next one was six. The other one was like 11 when I got here. Oh. Yeah. And there's definitely been some struggles along the way with training. I've not pushed them because, you know, they're not coming on stage with me. We're not really traveling very much anymore. Like I used to take my two backstage. So they, we had the same carrier. They would like, go in and like they had their spot so they, it was consistent they knew like okay we go to work there's the dressing room there's the noise of the stage so th they're very very good but do you have any advice on someone who is adopting a dog that's slightly older like a rescue dog and how to like i was trying to take my oldest to like pet smart or somewhere like that to, to do training and it was really difficult she was scared of the clicker that they had we had to like reverse everything so she would do something then we put the name or the word to the the action because yeah. i you could barely you couldn't go near her like you couldn't touch her it was a lot in the beginning she was yeah. really scared of men it was all these things so it was a very slow process and like just spending a lot of time like cuddling and being like see this is safe but do you have any advice for someone because we have some amazing rescues in vegas but it is you know there's a lot of dogs that are returned because it is hard mm -hmm. i think people are still under the impression even to this day that they can go to a shelter get a dog and it's going to be perfect dogs are not robots dogs are their own individual little selves and i always try and tell people if you're going to adopt a dog it's really important to maybe just test the dog out there are a whole bunch of simple tests you can do noise tests people test dog tests just to make sure that you know what you're signing up for. Because like you said, a dog is basically a lifetime commitment for the dog. Dogs live a very long time, sometimes 17 years, and you, you need to know what you're signing up for. And so I, like personally, yes, I do this for a living, so I'm looking for very specific qualities, but I wouldn't take a fearful dog. I wouldn't take a reactive dog. Sometimes those are things you can work through, but sometimes it's also things that you just have to manage. So it's just really important to know what you are getting into. And Knowing that it's okay to say no if you're not in the right situation to accept that into your life because it's a lot of work. And I mean, coming from somebody who has to manage a border collie that will kill another dog, like it, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely messaged you a few times where I'm like, I need help. I don't know what to do. It is tough because I want to do the best for my dogs. I, if I'm looking after anyone else's dogs, I'm always the core. They think because I've got three that I'm like, oh, I'll just take them all in, which I do do it. I'm a sucker. But it's difficult to manage. So At least many. you know. At least you know you're a sucker. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh, here we go again. And they've always, it's always the ones too. Like I have a friend's dog I look after now and again who's blind and diabetic. Like they're always got something going on. I'm like, oh no. So having to yeah. learn how to give him the shots and stuff. It's such beautiful dogs though. But yeah, have you ever had a moment throughout your career, whether it's in your personal life or work life, where you've thought, you know what? maybe this isn't for me. Maybe this is too much, too many dogs, too much responsibility. Has it ever just been like, that? maybe this isn't the right path for me anymore? And if so, how have you felt inspired or been motivated to push through that and be like, no, I love this. This is what I want to do. So I've been doing this for about 14 years now. And I feel, I feel like I, I know that this is what I was meant to do, but I definitely have felt burnt out at some events or, or competitions or whatever it is that I get into with my dogs. And honestly, the best way to, to get through that is just to one, feel the emotions, never bottle that up. And two, just to talk about it. So I have several friends that I will call or text and just talk about stuff like that. But I am like, I'm nearing the end and I know I am. I, I want change. I want something different. I've been taking care of dogs for the past 14 years and driving 40,000 miles a year. And so it's, it's a lot. And I know like most people fly and those, those people would probably say the same thing. Like they're sick of flying and they're ready to drive. And like, I've done the flying thing and the driving thing. So I'm just done, but I do still own an RV and like, I, I finally do have a house. So I've, I've really enjoyed being home, 
But mm -hmm. yeah, the, the performing aspect of my life, I think, is slowly coming to an end. Like maybe, I don't know, in the next few years, we'll see what will change. But it's just a matter of loving what you do and then knowing when it's time to stop, which is not a bad thing. You have to take care of yourself at, at the end of the day. So I definitely believe change is good. You do things as long as you want to do them, as, as long as you feel good doing it. I feel like the pandemic was definitely a time for me and a lot of performers that I knew that we had to take a step back and be like, wait, this could be it for us. What, what else do, can we do? What else do we love? And some had to take like early retirement because there were no shows to go back to. And they were kind of at that age of yeah. almost retiring and, and got thrown into it a little earlier. What would you do if you weren't like performing yeah. and traveling as well? I, I do. I still enjoy the training aspect of things. So I probably would take on some sort of training career path where it's just one dog at a time and it's light and easy and I can still find it fun. Because when you have so many dogs, it can become really overwhelming and you kind of just lose that joy. I get asked all the time, like what I, what I do to get out of that. And there really is no easy answer. Yeah. It really is just, you got to get up, you got to take care of the dogs and you got to force yourself to, to do the job, which is basically what people that do nine to fives do. So it's the same thing, even if you're an entrepreneur and you're doing it yourself. Are you at six mm -hmm. now? Yeah. Six dogs, two cats. That's it. That it? And, a, and a partridge and a pear tree. Six is a lot. Say you have five at one time. Do you get to that point and then go, okay, they're all at a very well-behaved, well-trained place. I can now bring in another one or mm -hmm. have you ever brought in two brand new? I've always had the rule of, I don't get another dog until the previous one is trained. And I think the closest I got was I brought in two puppies at the same time, but one of the puppies was not staying. So it really wasn't that bad. And then I got, I got Joker. He was eight months when I got him. I had him for about four months, five months maybe. And then I got another dog, but that dog was a year and a half. And so I never got two dogs that like were very green at the same time. Like, yes, the puppies were, but one wasn't staying. So it wasn't as difficult. But yeah, typically the rule is don't get another one until the previous one is trained. So on that note though, have you ever trained a dog and they've kind of reversed in their training? Does that ever happen? I'm going to say it really depends on the dog's age because dogs will mature, go through fear periods and growth spurts and all of that stuff. Hawkeye is probably the best example. Hawkeye can do every trick in the book. He has a beautiful walking handstand. He can jump rope. He can do all this stuff, but he visibly does not enjoy it. And that happened over time. But there were signs when he was younger that I, I could definitely read that he was not going to be a trick dog. But as he got older and matured, he 100% shows that he does not want to be doing the thing. So I think like in that regard, yes, it, it definitely can happen. And then when it comes to that point, because obviously, like you said, it is your work. It is your business. You've got to travel like, like everyone. We've all got to pay the bills. So then are you just looking for nice homes for these dogs? Like, do you have people that you know? Like, how, how have you dealt with that? And how do you yeah. deal with that? Like, like, inside, I get attached to other people's dogs that aren't even mine. <laughs> so how do you handle that one? Well, I, I, I will say that it gets easier. Every dog that I've placed goes with friends and family. So it's not like I never see them again. The biggest thing for me is I used to have a dog named Loki. He did America's Got Talent, and then he got sick at about two years old. I spent well over $30,000 trying to figure out what was wrong with him. The conclusion was he had an undiagnosed autoimmune disease. And when his steroids stopped working and I had to euthanize him, I withdrew my emotions when it comes to dogs. I am nice to them. I take care of them. I make sure they have everything that they need, but that is it. And it is very hard to connect with a dog after losing Loki. Like... It, it, it's something that I, I still to this day can't really explain. But ever since that moment, they're my coworkers, they're my teammates, they're my family, but I know that they're just there and they could leave me at any point. So when I do place a dog, I know that they're going to the best place possible. Like I'm actually about to place the dog in March and my friend Rachel straight up asked me, she's like, how much do you want for him? And I was like, I want you to cover his vet bills when they happen. That's it. You know, I don't want anything for him. I just want him to have a good, loving home. And that's it. I mean, yeah, it's definitely, I hate to say it's easy, but it for me, it really is. I, I get to see them and I know where they are at all times. But ever since losing Loki, it's, I, I will never love a dog like I did then. Oh, but no, but I get it. I get like, it's, you know, I ha thankfully touch wood. I still have hopefully a few more years with my oldest, but I've been there for other friends like who've lost their dogs yeah. and it, it just breaks your heart but but yeah. you know it's 
one not positive but i guess one way i try to look at it is you know i see so many older like humans in pain at an older age who just suffer and have to get on with it at least if there is suffering happening in an animal you can stop the suffering which is like a really messed up kind of thing to think about yeah it's true and like Like, loki 100 percent could have lived for probably another maybe year but he was dying like it was bad yeah yeah it, it was really bad and like Hero right now, Hero's 13. He has a heart condition. He's got valley fever. He's doing fine, like you said about your your old pupper. Like he's hacking. He sounds like he's a smoker. One of his elbows is like really bad arthritis, but he's happy. He's fine. He doesn't care. But the moment that it becomes clear, I have no problem yeah. stepping in. And the family that he's with, same thing. It's like the moment that he tells us he's not comfortable. Okay. But as of right now, she doesn't have a care in the world. It's, it's blowing my mind. I get more upset about it than I think. She, she just gets on with it. She just gets on with life. She gets on with the day. Like, she's sleeping a lot more. When I'm like, oh, let's go for a walk, she still, like, sits up. Like, am I coming? Am I coming? I'm like, get in the stroller. Let's go. Uh, and now that, that, so that person walking around, everyone's like, oh, he's a crazy lady with the dogs again. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm doing my best. So, Stephanie mentioned you've got your two cats. Like, why? Why Why did you bring cats into the mix? When did that happen? Why did that happen? I got my first cat, Goose. He was about three when I adopted him to be a mouser for uh, my property I was at. And he did his job great. He'd bring in full bunnies with no heads and he'd bring in birds and eat them and there'd be feathers all over my living room. He did his job great. And then when I left California, I took him because I was just so bonded to this cat. He's not a cat. He's a dog. He, he is one of his dog. He can do all the dog tricks. He's very motivated. He's super friendly. So I took him and he also became really good friends with Hawkeye. So they just love each other. My friend breeds uh, these Janettas. They're mostly Bengal. Mm-hmm. And I just fell in love. I was like, I need a male. And I think Goose will like a buddy. And let me tell you, cats are a whole different thing. Like, they're terrible. <laughs> cats are terrible. I, I, I've had a few cats in the past. I live with people that have cats. I was so naive. Oh, they're so cute. They're so lovely. But you forget that they, like with the dogs, you know, just nothing on the floor. That is my rule with anyone that's in the house. Nothing goes on the floor. Don't leave your bag on the floor. Abby has stolen many a granola bar out my bag in the past. Now we have a nothing on the floor rule. And then cats come in. And I'm like, why is there a cat on my counter, on my fridge, on my... They're everywhere. So my two cats are basically dogs. Goose meows 24-7 to communicate. I don't know what he's saying, but he tries. And (laughs) they're they're just, they're so much fun. They're they're honestly my entertainment. So like the dogs are my coworkers and everything. My cats are my pets. So they literally get away with murder. So when you got Goose then, was he already trained to like do that? Or you had a... No, they they were getting rid of him because he was doing it. Yeah, it worked out great. I believe they lived on like a bird sanctuary or something and he was eating the birds so they oh, couldn't keep him. I... You know, he, he came with the, uh, with I don't want to say the aggressiveness, but he knew what a cat was supposed to do and he did it well. I'm getting like a little notification saying cats. My camera at home is telling me my cats are doing something. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> you have cameras so you can spy on them when you're not there? Yes, yeah, because cats you can leave. Like they have like an automatic feeder and an automatic like litter box and all that stuff. Okay. So they they basically have their own room in my house. Like there's yeah, cats detected. Yep, there we go. Can you go outside with them? Like do um, they so, just stay with you? How how is that working? Goose used to when we were in California, but I live in the country and I just don't want anything to happen to him. Yeah. I mean, like I and like Maverick is really into the outdoors. I won't do it. Can you even train a cat to like? I, I would say so. You could. You, I would just probably leash train them at a really young age. Yeah, it's just I got Goose when he was about three, so I just mm-hmm. haven't even thought to, to do that. He can walk on a leash. I have lots of videos of him walking through towns and stuff. That's so funny to me because like, just from having cats, trying to get a harness near them. I, I'm, to be fair, I'm, you know, I don't have that much experience. I'm not a trainer. I do my best in any situation. And once again, like I've had like cats in the past who were rescues. I remember having one that was very, I hate to say aggressive because it sounds mean. I I call them spicy. I said it's a spicy cat. He was extra spicy, but such a beautiful cat. And it was such a weird thing because he wanted so much love, but then he hit a point where he was like, don't, and then he was over it. And it was really like just having to gauge where that limit was of like, okay, you get a little scratch that's it here's some food and like not pushing that whereas not gonna lie with my dogs I'm like 
cuddle me, stay with me and cuddle me. And they just want their peace. They're like, mum, enough. Leave me alone. Yeah. I'm not here to be, you know, cuddled to death. But yeah, he he took a lot of of work and like gaining the trust and knowing that we, yeah. you know, yeah. nothing bad was going to happen. So I think he was left in like an apartment complex or something oh. like that, and people just left. And yeah, it's it's pretty awful. Like the because I used to volunteer at Nevada SPCA here, and just the stories, you, all these things you find out. And there isn't one thing here that I wish there was. It's so difficult when you find a dog or a cat. Because I found a few, like Willow being one, and then I found another one when I was walking them. I was walking on the street with my three a few years ago, and this other one just joined us, and I was like, no, nope, 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 I've got three, we're not doing this again. Nope. I'm maxed out. <laughs> nope. I like, literally had to make a decision and being like, this isn't happening right now. And like, took my others home, put them in my car, because I was like, I don't know, you know, you don't know if they have their shots and all this stuff, right? And put them in my yeah. car, and then like, I don't know what to do. And, it was like a Sunday night, ran to the closest vet so they could check if you had a chip or anything, no chip, no collar. And I'm like, what, what is going on with these people that, you know, they just don't do these things for their dogs and there's nowhere to take them at night. I was like, I guess this dog's staying with me tonight. I drove around the neighborhood just yeah. looking for people that looked like they'd lost a dog. And yeah, it was a real shame. It was an older couple and he were like out walking, looking for him. And I was like, I went and got them a collar and stuff. And I was, they were like, yeah, he keeps like taking it off. And so oh my chip. gosh like how do they not like know this stuff yeah. or why are you not being told this that wherever you're getting your dog from it's it's unfortunate but yeah i wish we had that here where there was a place where any time of day if you find a dog or a cat you can take it somewhere i could could never imagine not keeping my dogs like my, my puppy my loves but like things happen right where people can't look after them anymore or they get sick or family members pass or they have to go somewhere and it's yeah it's a shame there isn't somewhere 24 hours that can just yeah look after them because you know i feel like it's so difficult because i've tried to help people rehome their pets in the past and it's not mm -hmm. that easy unless you're doing it like direct person to person there is quite a good community here at least a lot of good shelters and my two were from the same one yeah which they got me i got abby and then they two years later it was two years later they were like we have another dog for you i was like I don't need one. I have one already. <laughs> she was an angel too. Was great off the leash, would just walk with me. Was so well behaved. As soon as I said her name, she would just stop. And I was like, okay. So once we got over the fear, I couldn't believe how good she was. Yeah. And I was I spoiled with her completely. Walk backstage with me. Like she, I'd take her everywhere. Like be in the car with me, let's go wherever we're going. And then little Minnie arrived. They're like, oh, we have a little one. She looks just like your other one. She is nothing like my other one. She is not spicy, but she's got an attitude. She's a lot of <laughs> Oh and my gosh. She's not like a yappy one, thank goodness. She doesn't live up to, to that stereotype, but she stands up for herself, all four and a half pounds of herself. But they'll get you, those rescues. They'll, they know, they can smell it on you. They're like, oh, she'll take a few more. I love the name of your podcast. I think it's fantastic. If, if people know me, it's very fitting. But yeah, it was kind of born out of a, you know, I, I had Hot Mess, the show, which I produced for a few months last year. I use the term all the time, Hot Mess, because, I mean, same as you, like people see us on stage or see us performing or, you know, competing or whatever we're doing. And they see this very finished product. And I don't think people realize the amount of work that goes into it. They just, oh, they just find it easy. Some people just find their calling, but there's still so much work that goes into it. Yeah. You know, physically, emotionally, mentally, like in every area. Some of the episodes and more, some of the solo content is more about kind of the behind the scenes of that and it's like yeah I go up on stage and throw a smile on and everything's wonderful but then I don't get to have like a bad day it doesn't matter what's going on at home doesn't matter I'm going through my divorce like all right throw on a happy face let's go entertain a few hundred people in Vegas so it's I've been there it's I know <laughs> And it's tough to juggle. You really have to compartmentalize and mm -hmm. be like, I will deal with that feeling later. Right now, this is about these people. Yeah. They paid to see me do X, Y, and Z. They have not, not paid to give me therapy right now or watch me have a meltdown. So here we go. It's a new thing. It's fun. This week's been all like people that I kind of know or friends because I've never been on this side mm -hmm. asking the questions and it's a bit daunting. Yeah. And I don't <laughs> like, luckily I'm editing everything so I can be bad and like learn. It's just new. I'm just putting it out there.